Hello, everyone. Uh, today we have something very interesting to discuss on. Uh, this has been a trending topic for quite a while. A lot of people have been facing clinical challenges with IZC and buckle shell screws. So that brings us uh, to this discussion on Sunday about challenges faced during orthodontic treatment with buckle shell bone screws and their solution. Now we have split this uh, lecture into two parts. So today we are going to discuss about only about buckle shell bone screws. So basically, uh, before starting off with this presentation, we are going to discuss a case about uh, the, uh, which we have treated with uh, the bone screws. So it is a case of camouflage of class three skeletal malocclusion with dental asymmetry treated with the MBT system and unilateral buckle shell bone screws. It's biomechanics and clinical perspectives. For over half a decade of experience that we have had with these uh, uh, methodolo methodologies of treatment, uh, uh, we are going to share something with you uh, uh, which is going to help you uh, in everyday clinical practice. Now, now let us look into this case. This is a patient who comes at 23 years of age with spacing in the upper and crowding in the lower front teeth region. Uh, she has a class C uh, skeletal malocclusion, but then she has only come due to spacing of upper and uh, upper teeth basically, and uh, that she was unhappy with her smile. Uh, when we did an uh, extra oral examination, we uh, came to know that she had a mild a asymmetry. Uh, basically, the mandible was shift to the, shifted to the left, which was basically a functional shift, uh, not a true skeletal asymmetry. Uh, she also had uh, the lower dental asymmetry with spacing in the upper and crowding in the lower anterior teeth. So basically, it was a compensated class 3 situation where she also had an edge to edge bite. Now, uh, she was unhappy with the aesthetic component of her smile because of spacing and that the upper incisors were seriously proclined. Uh, and uh, she also felt that the lower jaw was slightly big, but then uh, she was not concerned about it too much. So she had a mild concavity in facial profile. When we looked at the intraoral view, we came to know that the asymmetry was uh, uh, because of a class three molar relationship on the right hand side. And there was an occlusal interference in the one, two and the four, three, uh, that is upper right lateral incisor and lower right canine, which was causing the mandible to deviate to the left. She had a class one molar relationship and an edge to edge bite. Uh, left side had a class one and the right side had a class three. Uh, so there was crowding in the mandibular uh, dentition. There was a midline shift to the left by about three millimeters. So basically, these are cases of compensated class threes where you get a bit of retroclination of the lower incisors and a lot of proclination of the upper incisors leading to spacing. And you have a skeletal relationship and a dental relationship, either unilaterally or bilaterally, a class three. So in this case, it was a unilateral class three on the right hand side. Now, the occlusal view showed that there was proclination of the upper incisors leading to spacing. The lower had crowding in the lower anteriors. Uh, there was one very important point to be noted that she had unadapted third molars. Basically, the third molars were congenitally missing in the lower arch as well as in the upper arch. Now, we did a cephalometry. We showed that there was significant proclination of the upper incisors, which is commonly seen uh, in a, a mid-phase deficiency case or a class 3 case. And she had almost normally inclined lower incisors. Now, when you have retrocline lower incisors to start with, at that point of time, camouflage of class three becomes a bit difficult. But in this situation, there was slight proclination of the lower incisors, which led us to decide that this case to, could be treated by camouflaging the underlying class three skeletal molecule. So that's a composite analysis. When it did, did a tracing and superimposed on the face, that's what exactly it showed, that it's a class three skeletal base and procline upward incisors and mildly procline lower incisors. The cephalometric uh, value showed that the NB angle is minus three degree, which shows that it's definitely a class three case. The INPA was 92, so they, they were not retroclined, but mildly proclined. Upper incisors uh, inclination was 38 and 10.6, which shows that they were severely proclined. 
So if we are to correct the inclination of the upper incisors, we will get actually a lot of negative overjet. Uh, that is uh, uh, when we decompensate this case. The FMA was 26, which means that it's an average growth pattern. Uh, and the nasolabial angle was about 77, which shows that the since the uppers were proclined, he had an acute nasolabial angle. So basically, it's a class 3 skeletal base, average growth pattern, proclined upper and lower incisors, and a concave facial profile. Now, what does the radiograph show? The radiograph shows that on the right and the left side, the third molars were congenitally missing. Now, if we were treating it by the old school of thought, whenever we find, uh, uh, when we want to do a class three camouflage, we usually extract the lower first premolars. Now, things have changed over the years. And if this patient was advised a lower first premolar extraction, uh, there would be a lot of discussion happening with uh, the patient regarding as to why do we want to extract. But then when we have the option of utilizing third molar spaces in today's era with the use of buckle shell bone screws, why not use it? Basically, then we would treat the case non-extraction. She had already visited a previous orthodontist who had advised her a single premolar extraction on the right-hand side in order to correct the dental asymmetry and to get a positive overjet. But then she wanted to take a second opinion. And the moment that we said that the third molar was missing uh, and we can use that space for and we can avoid extraction, she was quickly convinced to undergo this form of treatment. So you have to understand that this non-extraction form of treatment is always a motivation to the patient. And if we can do it by the use of recent technologies, that is exactly what we are supposed to do in today's era. But if the third molar was in occlusion or it was uh, you know, uh, it was impacted, then distillation is not possible. Uh, in that case, extraction of the third molar or extraction of premolars need to be opted for. But here, as you can see from the distal aspect of the, uh, of the second molar to the anterior border of the ramos, we have a lot of place on the right-hand side where we can convert the right-hand side class three into a class one molar relationship by full arch distillation. So how, is, how much is the amount of distillation actually possible in such cases? Now we have anatomic boundaries and limitations. So the amount of distillation possible is equal to the distance from the distal most aspect of the second molar to the anterior border of the rhombus. That is the amount of distillation actually possible. Now on the left-hand side, we were not to bother about because uh, you know uh, that was a class, uh, that side was a class one molar relationship already. And there was a functional sheet of the mandible also because of the interference in the uh, lateral incisor and the canine on the right hand side. Now, since the third molars were missing, so the extraction is was not done, or the plan was not even given to the patient. Now, what are the limitations of mandibular arch distillation that we are supposed to know? Now, not every case of class C can be treated by camouflage. Now, uh, that is in reference to a GIOS interview given by Dr. Junji Sugawara in which he said that there's something called as the angle of inflection. It's the angle formed by the lingual cortical plate of the mandible to the anterior border of the ramus. Now, basically it means that the lingual cortical plate is the anatomic boundary for distillation. So if your third molar is actually present, uh, there is no chance, uh, as you can see, uh, for distillation. So either you have to extract the third molars and distillate, or you can extract premolars and use the regular methods of retraction for camouflage of class three. Now that brings us to uh, one of the earliest article uh, put forward by Chris Chang on orthodontic bone screws, a quick update and its promising future. It indeed is a promising future uh, because for umpty lot of cases that we have treated, we have faced, we have got some excellent results. We have faced challenges and that's the purpose of this presentation to share with you those challenges so that you can over it, overcome it in your clinical practice. So what is the ideal configuration of a bone screw? Why are we talking about this is that there are a lot of bone screws of different, different companies available in the market, which does not follow these criteria. You know, so whenever you're buying bone screws, you better uh, buy it the best uh, possible one because these are very technique sensitive methods and you are placing them in D1 quality bone. You really don't want them to fracture. Also, there is a lot of other complexities we develop if your armamentarium is not great. 
So I would advise you that you choose your bone screws according to the specific criteria which we have mentioned, rather than go by the cost or go by the promotional aspect of it. Now, uh, what is the ideal uh, thing that you should see in a bone screw? It should actually have a smooth mushroom shaped large head for comfort and retention of the e chain or the nitrate coil spring. It should have a double neck design for easy hygiene control and extra attachments. It also uh, should have a, a long soft tissue collar. Basically, you, uh, you will see that how soft tissues can get covered if at all you don't have this component in the screw. It should be made of stainless steel. For us, we blandly propose that titanium alloy normal mini implants are not to be placed in the buckle shell area due to chances of fracture and due to uh, them getting covered with heavy soft tissue in that area. So stainless steel is the screw that of choice. You need to have four way rectangular holes for liver arm mechanics if you want to use for correction of impacted teeth. It should be about 12 to 14 millimeters in length at least so that it can reach the area of the buckle shell. And it should have some good sharp cutting edge. Otherwise you will have a lot of insertion torque. It will cause a lot of bone damage and can lead to loosening of the screw at a later date. Because those are heavy density bones, almost more than uh, 1200 Hounsfield units. And you really need a good sharp screw for drilling. For people who don't have the sharp screw, they have to do a lot of pre-drilling. But if you're using a really good screw, hardly you need pre-drilling even in such heavy density of bone, uh, wherever you find heavy density of bone. So as you can see that if you see, uh, compare it with stainless steel and titanium alloy, you have uh, the elastic modulus, yield strength and tensile strength of stainless steel much more than the titanium alloy. And therefore the prone to breakage of these screws uh, is far lesser. So whenever you are using bone screws, it has to be of these criteria, which we have mentioned. Otherwise you are into trouble and then, uh, then it's, a, it's a long run process of, uh, of recovery. Now in this case, uh, there was no consent for orthographic surgery and the patient was also skeptical about any teeth removal. But since uh, the, we know that we are going to use this method, okay, of using buckle shelf screws, we use a two into 12 millimeter screw uh, and we, uh, the, the biomechanics uh, of buckle shell and IZC screws are given by, uh, by Almeida in the Dental Press Journal. It's a wonderful article which came out in 2019. You can go through that to understand uh, how uh, the biomechanics of buckle shell uh, varies with respect to uh, height of the bone and height of the buckle shell. Now, the treatment planning uh, was to use a bone screw, as you can see on the left-hand side, so that the fourth vector is parallel and close to the occlusal plane. We never want to use in these situations a mini implant because it needs to be placed interdentally and the trajectories of force vary. So what is the method uh, the, or the treatment plan that we are using, summing it up? We have a missing 4.8. So closure of spaces in the upper arch by retraction and decrowding of the lower incisors by proclination of lower incisors. That would lead to decompensation of the, uh, uh, of the compensation of class C that we are already having in this case. That would lead to uh, negative overjet uh, developing. And then what we want to do is that we want to unilaterally full arch distalize the lower arch. By, uh, by that method, improving of class three skeletal uh, pattern would happen and you will get a class one molar relationship on either side. That's basically our treatment plan. So what is the prescription that we are using? We are now using normal uh, the MBT brackets because patient opted for it and she wanted ceramic also. So the upper arch, uh, basically we don't have uh, much to discuss on. We are using the regular MBT uh, torque and tip uh, system. Uh, the, and the, the purpose of uh, uh, bracing of the upper arch is basically to uh, close, close up the existing spaces by retraction of the upper incisors. So that's uh, uh, what we are doing in the upper arch. In the lower arch, uh, we want to do something different. In all cases of camouflage of class three, uh, we really don't uh, want the lower incisors to tip back so that the IMPA reduces drastically. We want bodily retraction of the lower incisors. And that's sometimes difficult when you are camouflaging class three. So in this case, we inverted the lower incisor brackets so that from minus six, it becomes plus six. In that situation, okay, what happens is that the amount of tipping becomes far lesser and you get bodily distalization of the lower arch. 
It also negates the chance of dehiscence developing in the lower anteriors and the formation of washboard appearance and thinning of the gingiva in that area. So this is one tips that you can take from when class C camouflage cases, we tend to invert the standard torque brackets so that we get a lot of positive torque in the lower incisors so that they don't tip during the process of heavy discolization. Now, what is the wire sequencing that we use? We use uh, for both in the upper arch 169 nitai to start with for 40 days and then go to a 18 SS. Then we place a 1925 nitai. But our main working archware is basically the 1925 SS, both in the upper and the lower arch. Uh, we retract by 1925 SS because uh, you know the heavy amount of force that you are giving for the process of full arch distillation, which is like 300 grams of force per side. You really don't want to have uh, much play in the archware and the archware to be flexible. So you are supposed to use stainless steel and the minimum dimension of stainless steel that you are supposed to use is a 1925 watt, not lesser than that, in a 022 slot. Now, uh, you can always use something even higher, but then we tend to get bracket uh, breakages with 2125. So we specifically opt for a 1925 SS. We know that the play is about 10 degrees with that. Now, this works well with us, but nothing lesser dimension than this uh, 1925 SS wire. So we use a posted wire with crimpable hook uh, and inverted uh, the, uh, lower incisor brackets. So this is the treatment progress where we can see that after alignment of the upper and the lower edge, you will notice that how the total occlusion has changed. On the right hand side, it is still class C, but the, but the occlusion interferences between 1, 2 and 4, 3 has now gone. And therefore, on the left-hand side, you have started developing a bit of a crossbite in the posteriors. So that exactly happens uh, because of positioning of the mandible, uh, mandible with respect to the, uh, the new, uh, after the alignment of the teeth. You will see in most cases. You also see that there is a canting of the lower uh, occlusal plane that is happening after that. So you still have a midline shift, but then you have crossbite on the left-hand side and the canines are no more sitting into class one. That compensation uh, that you see in a class C is almost completely gone. And we are in the process of distalizing on the right hand side. The midline is still off. And we have inverted standard dog brackets in the lower arch. So this is exactly uh, the, a buckle shell placed and we are distalizing the right hand side. Now, uh, the, what is the biomechanics involved in this process? When you place the buckle shell implant, we are working archware is a 1925 stainless steel archware. As you can see that we are giving a force of 300 to 350 grams per side and nothing less than that is going to work because now you have to count all the teeth. That is about uh, you know, 14 teeth in the lower arch. We are distalizing it together. Uh, and which would lead to a, uh, a component of force uh, generated in the lower, which would cause about a little bit of extrusion in the anteriors and a little bit of intrusion in the, uh, in the posteriors. Now, the great advantage of buckle shell screws come here that they are, since they're longer and they're placed in the buckle shell area, the point of application of the force is very close to the occlusal plane. So you really don't get too much of a side effect. In the same case, if you are putting it between interdentally between uh, five and six, then what happens is that the trajectory of the force become a bit more tangential. And therefore, you get a lot of posterior intrusion and an anterior extrusion. So, Biomechanics wise, with respect to distalization, buckle shell implants work wonderfully well. Now, if you have an inverted uh, bracket, okay, what happens is that it prevents the process of tipping. So you have uh, a couple due to a force and a couple generated due to a bracket, which contracts each other and gives you bodily distalization of teeth. So the net effect is distalization and clockwise rotation of the of the mandibular arch because when you distalize uh, you wedge uh, the tooth uh, more posteriorly, which opens up the mandibular plane a bit, uh, which helps in correction of or camouflage of the class three skeletal base. So uh, that's what we are looking at uh, in this case. As the treatment progresses, as you can see that things are working out far better. The canting in the lower occlusal plane is gone. Now the midline is perfectly on. Uh, and you have a class one on the right hand side and a class one on the left hand side. But I'll share you a, a problem uh, that developed during uh, during this process was 
On the left hand side, we were getting endonish relationship and a cross bite was developed. So what we did was we kept expanding the upper arch wire so that, you know, according to the foot and shoe principle, the maxillary arch should, uh, uh, should be large enough to hold or have the mandibular arch within it. So therefore, since now you're distalizing, uh, what happens is that that, uh, that fitting has to be developed by the orthodontist themselves. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of high points, occlusal interferences. Uh, you really don't want to happen this to the patient. So we have to keep seeing the posterior uh, occlusion, which is getting developed. So in this case, frostbite was developing, uh, partially uh, uh, because of uh, the transverse deficiency of the maxilla. And we corrected it dentally. We didn't use the marpe, but we corrected it dentally by expansion of the upper archway. Uh, and then using our class two elastic on the left-hand side to get a good CT occlusion. So now you see that the midline is good. So you have a class two traction, which we gave on the left-hand side and a class three uh, uh, traction, which we gave on the right-hand side uh, in order to correct this asymmetry. Now, this is the final results that we got at the end of the treatment. Okay, the, now from class C, we have a class one molar and a canine relationship, an excellent fit of the upper and the lower incisors and uh, posterior occlusion. Uh, on the left hand side, it is perfectly class one again. The midlines are perfectly on. Uh, you know, we had spacing in the upper anteriors, we had edge to edge bite, everything was attended to. Uh, so, uh, this is close to a perfect occlusion and a bite. And we also got about 2.5 millimeters of overjet because we really want to overcorrect it a bit uh, because all class threes need to be overcorrected because you have a residual mandibular growth happening happening uh, as late as 25 years of age. Uh, so we corrected the upper proclination, spacing, midline disturbance, negative overjet. Uh, this is the upper arch after treatment. Uh, you can see that uh, we have widened up the upper arch uh, and given a, a a decent art form to the patient. Uh, bond, uh, bonded lingual retainers are placed both in the upper and the lower after closure of the spaces in the upper arch and decrowding in the lower arch. And flu large distillation in the lower arch also. So this is the final result of this patient where we see the midline is pretty decent as of now. Uh, excellent smile aesthetics uh, the, at the end of the treatment. Uh, she uh, At 45 degree view, the smile aesthetics uh, it, it looks great. Uh, she had a perfect uh, profile at the end of her treatment, absolutely orthogonal. Uh, the, so uh, these cases, borderline cases, okay, uh, the, are indicated to be treated with IZC uh, and buccal shelves, screws, basically uh, to mention buccal shelves. So the, this is the post-treatment OPG where you note that no root resorption in the molar area after full cuff distillation. Okay, that's about five to six millimeters of distillation. As you can see that there is a now significant reduction of distance uh, the, from the anterior border of the ramus to the distal aspect of the second molar, which is an ample testimony to the fact that you got a significant amount of distillation. That's about five million millimeters of mandibular arch distillation. The divergence of the roots of the upper and the lower arch looks great at the end of the treatment. So cephalometry shows that yes, we have corrected the, the upper incisor inclination by quite some. Uh, the, we had retracted the lower incisor more broadly you can actually see there's a lot of bone anterior to the lower incisors, which means that the camouflage that we have done has not caused any washboard appearance or thinning of the gingiva or attached gingiva in the lower anterior region. Uh, that, that is very, very important if you want to maintain uh, the, uh, the integrity of the periodontium for a long duration of time. If you end up uh, exposing the lower incisor uh, roots, okay, uh, then first of all, it's going to uh, relapse. The secondly, that the longevity of the dentition, which is the primary concern for any dental uh, surgeon, is going to get compromised. So uh, you need to choose your case very, very, very wisely. So this is the tracing post-treatment, where we see that the inclination of the upper and lower incisors are corrected, and we got a class one molar relationship on either side. So what are the post-treatment uh, uh, cephalometric parameters? We saw that uh, the NB is still minus uh, the three, which means that we have not corrected skeletally. Uh, the IMP has Im uh, improved to 90 from 92. So you see that we have broadly retracted the incisors rather than causing a lot of tipping. Uh, the upper incisor inclination has definitely improved from 38 onwards. Uh, the FMA is still uh, the 26. Uh, uh, so we have not, we have had good vertical control in this case. 
also. The nasal wear angle is 81, uh, which shows that the upper incisors have retracted and the lips have fallen back. So the final results that we got out of this uh, treatment is it's still a class C skeletal malocclusion and an average growth pattern. But there is proclined upper incisors, minor, but it is improved. Uh, normal inclination of the lower incisors, negative overjet, overcorrected, and straight facial profile. That's a perfect example of camouflage of a skeletal class C malocclusion. Now, this is how the treatment progressed from class three mono relationship on the right hand side to use of buckle chub screws and finishing it with class one molar relationship on the right hand side and correction of those occlusal interferences which we had initially. And uh, in the anteriorly, we see that there is a huge amount of midline shift which has got corrected during the course of the treatment because of unilateral distalization of the arch. And we got a midline which is perfectly on at the end of the treatment. So we have something like this. Now, this is the pre-op and the post-op comparison. We show that the midline is perfectly on as of now. So improvement of facial asymmetry, minor facial asymmetry, which was initially there. The smile aesthetics have definitely improved because we have closed up the upper spaces and uh, corrected the dental asymmetry, which was persisting in the, uh, in the patient. The 45 degree view showed that the upper incisor inclinations have definitely improved and that was not possible unless and until we dislike the lower arch also, because you need to have about two millimeters of positive overjet at the end of the treatment. So that's improvement in smile aesthetics. The profile uh, and procumbency of the lip definitely improved during the course of the treatment. So that's concavity of profile has, has improved and procumbency of lip has also improved. Now, pre and post of comparison of uh, the lateral cephalogram show that you have corrected inclination of the upper incisors quite significantly. You have displaced uh, the, the, the lower arch and got corrected the inclination and the interincisal angle has definitely improved at the end of the treatment. Now, uh, the, these, uh, these, are, uh, these are the cases which we have been treating over the years, but we are here to discuss what are the problems that come up. Now, that brings us to a very uh, uh, important note or quote of the day that we found out from the net. When you are having about 100% success rate, you are a student and you tend to give big advices uh, to your juniors and fellow mates. When you have 80% success rate, you still remain a student, but you seldom advise. Okay. Uh, when you have 70% success rate, you are now a teacher, but you, you choose your advice very wisely and you are skeptical because you know there are a lot of chances of failures. When you have a 60% success rate, you are now a speaker. So you should understand that I have failed more times than you have failed. And when you have about 50% success rate, you're now a philosopher, guide, a PG guide, and mostly keep quiet because you know how things work in a clinical scenario and you need to be humble as a clinician. When you have about 40% success rate, you get a lifetime achievement award, okay? Because you have a lot of wisdom. So that brings us to uh, understanding something very unique. Information is not knowledge. Uh, the only source of knowledge is experience and you need experience to gain wisdom. So unless and until you do it on your own, everything remains on paper. We do not learn from experience also. We learn from reflecting on experience. So for all the failures that we have had over the years, we have started analyzing them, and now we tend to get lesser of them, or at least we know how to avoid them. So what are the complications associated with buckle shell bone screws? Finding the buccal shelf area in the Indian population is itself very tough. Very different from the Oriental population as we have noticed. And I tend to treat both Indian and Oriental population because I'm placed in Kolkata, but I get a lot of Indian crowd, but I get a lot of people from the Northeastern part of India who are of Oriental origin. I'll tell you the difference between them with respect to the buccal shelf areas. We have soft tissue coverages, which is a big problem, okay, when you are placing buccal shelf. Biomechanical complications may come out, which is called as posterior open bite, canting of occlusal plane, and we might get cross bites also because you are applying a force buckle to the center of resistance of the arch. You can get a lot of gingival recession in the lower anteriors if you have poor case selection. Thankfully, we never had it because we chose them after a lot of analysis. If placed well, 
losing of buccal shell bone screws are rare which is a great news okay because whenever you are camouflaging a class c and patient really don't want surgery you really want the buccal shell shell to a screw to stay for long and not loosen during the course of the treatment which could be detrimental to the progress of the treatment no chance of christmas because the buccal shell area is devoid of any muscular attachments and hence the chances of christmas are very very less no nerve damage because you are far away from the core of the mandible where the inferior alveolar nerve lies now what is the good point about buccal shell bone screws in reality and both in literature they have a very high rate of stability with us and success rate that's about greater than 93% for this article uh, in which uh, 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 chris chang and uh, eugen roberts uh, uh, assess the primary failure rate of about 1680 extra alveolar bone screws they found out the success rate to be greater than 93% so that's great it's not as good in in case of izc but with respect to buccal shell the bone quality is so good and if you are place placing good quality uh, bone screws the chances of failures are very very less that's a great news but what are the problems that we come up now where is this buccal shell by the way the buccal shell bone screws are having a width of about 2 into 12 mm so you are supposed to place in good quality bone the problem that happens if you can see in this opg itself is one of my patients on the right hand side we have placed the buccal shell on uh, uh, right hand side of the patient we have placed the buccal shell bone screws much more distally almost in the external of the ridge and on the left hand side it is placed lateral to the second molar this 4 mm lateral to the second molar where everyone advises or every article says in the one single patient we find such a lot of anatomical variation that on the right side while placing when i was placing it i did not at all find any bone or the back buccal shell was so deep that if i place one buccal shell on the right hand side very deep and the other buccal shell on the left hand side in the right area what would happen you will get canting of the occlusal plane because the trajectory of force uh, heights will increase Uh, and or be variable now therefore what we had to do is that since we are not finding enough bone on the right hand side in the buccal shell area we had to go back and place the buccal shell uh, bone screw in the external oblique ridge now we see a lot of studies standardizing where to place a buccal shell but a clini- uh, but as a clinician with 6 years 7 years of experience with buccal shell bone screws i am telling you that no article is uh, the, uh, the will justify the anatomical variation that you see in each patient itself forget about a group of people so this is one of the cases which we are sharing so that you can understand that is the very uh, uh, the concept of where the buccal shell is has a lot of anatomical variation and with clinical experience you will know how to place this buccal shell screws and where to place it so you can see that external oblique ridge placement for patients with no or deeply placed buccal shelf as we have done in this case so that's exactly one of the big problems in the same patient if you see on the left hand side the buccal shelf screw uh, is the mushroom head of the buccal shelf screw is sticking out and we have been able to engage the e chain that's because it's placed in the buccal shelf area and the buccal shelf area in that area was shallow so the uh, so what happened was the head was lying outside the soft tissue the moment we mo- went more distally on on the on the right hand side of the mandible we found that the soft tissue grew over it over the same screws and now we have to uh, re- manipulate the soft tissue every time that we are changing the uh, the, uh, the e chain so uh, you know that is pretty painful to the patient a lot of discomfort to the patient and for a clinician it's quite a challenge because you really every month you really have to find out where the buccal shell screw is and find out but there is no other option because on the right hand side we did not find uh, a bone in the buccal shell area so where to place them we really palpate them and find it out so that's one of the big big problems which you will face and this variability is in a single patient so you can understand that every patient is unique in its own way so what is this literature says the literature uh, if you look into this article by nusera okay uh, it says that bone and cortical plate thickness in the buccal shell area in adults uh, they found it on an average it is 4 mm lateral to the roots of the second molar 
but uh, the, when we looked into this article by Vargas on mandibular buccal shell and infrazygomatic thickness of patients with different vertical facial heights, we noted that there was quite a lot of difference among horizontal and, and vertical growers itself. So there is a lot of variability uh, in, uh, in them. Again, when we went to this article in the Korean Journal of Orthodontics, okay, we found that well, different vertical facial patterns, we have different sizes of buccal shells. And the position of the buccal shell is very, very variable. But overall, everyone comes to the consensus that the buccal shell area in the mandible is lateral, a 4 mm lateral to the uh, 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 buccal, basically 4 mm buccal to the roots of the second molar. We also have uh, anatomy, uh, this article which talks about anatomic assessment of mandibular buccal shell areas and insertion in white patients, where they again talk about their four millimeters. And again, an article which came out from India on tomography mapping of buccal shell area for optimum placement of bone screws. They also found out that there is a lot of variability. Then they also propose that it is supposed to be lateral to the second model. But as, as you can see in a clinical scenario, things can be very, very different. So articles and research are on one side and your patient sitting on the chair might not show anything out of them. So you need to have this backup knowledge uh, because that's a standard, but deviations uh, are very, very, very common. So you have to be uh, geared up for those things, those clinical challenges. So what is the difference? You need to understand that all these buckle shell bone screws and other screws became very, very popular from a group of orthodontists in Taiwan uh, by Dr. John Lin or Dr. Chris Chang. And for, uh, for the patients that we have treated of ori oriental origin and Indian population and treat both of them uh, almost equally, equal numbers, we have noted that on the oriental side, uh, oriental population, they usually have shallow and wide buckle shells. As you can see on the left-hand side, it's a, it's a shallow buckle shell and it's a wide one. The, there's a great advantage of having a shallow one, so that because you know the head uh, is uh, keeps uh, is outside the soft tissue. Okay, you get a lot of bone in that area. The chances of failures are very less. The chances of the buccal shell bone screw going towards the core of the mandible is also very very less. So that's a uh, you we find it in the northeastern population uh, of India, uh, and. Uh, and the moment we see a, a patient from that, we find that, okay, we have a lot of buccal shell. But the moment, but most of the patients of Indian origin don't tend to have that. They have buccal shell, but it is way too deep and not so wide. So at some point of time, what happens is that the more deep you go with respect to placement of the screw, the trajectory of the force does not remain close to the functional occlusal place. And therefore, what happens, you get you get a lot of posterior open bite and an anterior deep bite. Uh, and once your occlusion during this uh, process uh, uh, goes for a toss, uh, it is very, very difficult to, uh, to settle the bite at a later date. So you need to know that whenever you're going very deep, it is better to go much more distally and place it in the external oblique ridge. So that's the difference between Oriental and Indian population. I think someone, some PE student can take up a thesis on that and they would definitely find because we have been seeing hundreds and hundreds of patients in uh, this difference and almost in everyone is the same. So what happens? So this is the case of a buccal shelf implant placed in an Oriental population. As you can see that the buccal shelf uh, area is pretty wide. Uh, we have placed it lateral to the second molar. That's exactly where it needs to be placed. Uh, the, the screw is well within the bone. And the core of the mandible, where is the inf inferior alveolar nerve is, is way away from this, uh, from this area of operation. So, and you can also see the amount of thickness of the bone that is available lateral to the second molar root in these patients. That's exactly what we are discussing. That evidence of shallow and wide buccal shelves in oriental population. Uh, the, of the northeastern region of India and uh, for the oriental populations that uh, the Taiwanese people are treating. So uh, as you can see uh, that uh, this is a CBCT of the same patient uh, of oriental origin where we have placed a buccal shell screw. Uh, you know, evidence of shallow and wide buccal shells in oriental population as we have discussed. That is a therefore, it's an increased distance from the intraavular nerve canal and point of application of the force is very close to the functional occlusal plane. That's exactly uh, the, uh, the beneficial aspects of having a shallow buckle shell. 
but uh, we have used it in Indian patients also, but we have used it a bit more distal. So therefore, when uh, you have very deep buccal shelves, the trajectory of force become more like a mini implant because mini implants are placed more interdentally and much below the occlusal plane. Uh, and when you have deep buccal shelves, you also have a buccal shelf placed very deep uh, away from the occlusal plane. So in that case, the trajectory of force, you also have to note it down that whenever you are, whenever you are doing uh, full arch distalization bilaterally, you need to see that both the buccal shelves on either side are at least in the same uh, level or horizontal plane. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of canting in the occlusal plane. Okay, I, interferences would develop occlusal interferences. You will not be able to assess the bite. And then it's quite a tragedy because you have to understand that in technique sensitive procedures like this, it's the fourth company. You are, it's not a sliding which is happening. Uh, when you are doing full arch distalization, it is a it's a balancing act of forces which is distalizing the whole arch together. So the wire is actually not sliding through the molar tube. It is the whole segment of the wire which is wire and the teeth together which is mo moving back with respect to the force that you are giving. So the force has to be really balanced and equal on either side. So what happens when you have a very deep buccal shelf? Uh, you know we propose that you have a very very deep buccal shelf. Okay, you place it in the external oblique ridge which is. So in the first situation, you can see when you have a deep buccal shelf, the trajectory of the force is much more tangential. Now, when we are going much more distally and placing it in the external oblique ridge, the force become much more parallel to the occlusal plane. And therefore, you will not get posterior open bite and anterior deep bite developing in these patients. So if you find in the Indian population, that's my clinical suggestion, that if you find in the Indian population that the buccal shelf is very, very deep and the screw is going way too deep in the second molar region, you better go more distally and place it at the level closest to the occlusal plane, okay, in the external oblique reach area, which is also a very safe area to place uh, the screws. Uh, don't place it in the ramal area, but you place it in the external oblique reach area. Because if you place it in the ramal area, again, what happens is you, get, you will get that you will get anterior open by. Okay. Uh, that's uh, the fourth configuration which keeps changing when you are according to the position of your buccal shell screw. The other big problem that happens, okay, apart from the biomechanical part, is that you get a lot of soft tissue coverage. Uh, now, when you have these soft tissue coverages, the big problem that happens is that uh, whenever you're placing it in the external oblique ridge or you're placing it in a very deep buccal shave area, the soft tissue gets covered in a single appointment itself. Forget about waiting for three months and up. Now, once that happens, every time the patient comes and you have to chain the E-chain, you really have to laser out the soft tissue. Uh, that's uh, a minor surgical process every appointment. That's very irritating to the patient. You try to find out the buccal shell by putting your finger out there. It's very painful for the patient. You'll get bleeding from that area because you are manipulating soft tissue and it becomes a mess. If you find that, okay, that you are placing it a bit deep and the soft tissue in and around that area is very, very, uh, is very, very uh, uh, thick, it's better that you place a hook, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, attached already to the buccal shell bone screws. Okay, so you bend a, a hook with a 1920 arch wire, tie a ligature to the buccal shell screw, and expect that the buccal shell screw is going to go inside and this uh, the screw is going to hang out. So it becomes very, very easy for the patient. Okay, your hook is hanging out, patient doesn't even feel it. Okay, and you use a E-chain uh, to activate it every time. So you really don't have to manipulate the soft tissue. Now that is very, very essential because, you know, as it is, it's a technique sensitive process. It's also uh, a, a minor surgical process that you are doing on the patient. Patient comfort is very, very important when you are doing something. You really need to have the patient by your side when you are doing uh, such gross teeth movement like distalization of the full arch. There is also another problem, as you can see here, all the buccal gels are placed lateral to the, to the, to the arch. Uh, and therefore, you tend to get a lot of cross bites developing, uh, developing because of flaring of the, uh, the of the second molar and the first molar in that area. It is better that you use a mildly constricted arch form in the, uh, the in the lower arch and use a uh, expanded arch form in the upper arch and check every appointment that your bite is pretty decent because that's very very important. Okay, if your bite is not good at the end of the treatment, all efforts of getting a positive overjet is going to relapse and the patient will have functional problems leading to TMJ at a later date. 
you see that there is uh, this patient you had this traumatic fibrosis in that area okay so you will get all these soft tissue responses so we know that things are going to happen is better prevention is better than cure so you better add a hook to it initial appointment itself that's exactly what you do so if you see the opg of the same patient what we have done is we have placed a buccal shell and we have used a a hook it is sticking out of the soft tissue uh, so what is the ideal criteria as you can see uh, this one uh, of placing a buccal shell screw you have a mushroom head you have a large head screw you need to have a good soft tissue collar okay in spite of that many situations the uh, you know it tends to get covered the the soft tissue tends to cover the head then you have the stainless steel screws okay because they need to place in thick quality of bone as you can see the uh, quality of the bone in that area is very very dense and you place hooks in the area of heavy soft tissues before hand itself so that's exactly what you are supposed to do if you are placing either in the external oblique ridge or deep buccal shell if you have a very shallow buccal shell uh, and uh, you have ample amount of uh, of uh, the head sticking out of the soft tissue you really, really don't need to place the hook but this is the problem which we face in the indian population almost every day so uh, what do we do we basically uh, use a 9025 arch and make a hook like this attach with the ligature and then use a, a, a chain so that makes your life very very easy so uh, as you understand that uh, you will develop biomechanical issues okay in your initial cases that's a problem uh, and the the anatomical limitation of an indian buccal shell does not help in the process but you need to learn working with it and get good results out of it as it's definitely possible to get it in spite of those anatomical limitations that's the purpose of this presentation so that you don't come across this problems or if you come across them you know what to do so uh, if you really want to uh, know more about uh, the problems and uh, the way of placement and all this is an article written by us which became really popular uh, uh, in the 50th uh, edition of the journal of indian orthodontic society on the use of infrazygomatic and buccal shell screws the clinical perspectives uh, uh, which is which i feel uh, is quite a must read uh, we have been interacting with you in this forum and uh, the, uh, the, for the past two years now and we really uh, happy to see your response and the number of people and the number of views that we get uh, so we will keep adding clinical tips for you in the future also you can always write back to me in whatsapp in this contact number we can always share uh, you can also follow us in instagram we will keep following uh, and uploading uh, our treated cases on an everyday basis and thank you uh, for taking your time out on a sunday uh, and patiently listening to us it's uh, it's wonderful to interact with you in this forum as always